Hello and welcome to the session on Baroque Spinoza. Baruch Spinoza was a Dutch philosopher of Portuguese Jewish origin who lived and worked during the Age of Reason. Along with René Descartes and Gottfried Leibniz, he is considered one of the great rationalists of the 17th century, although the breadth and importance of his work was not fully realized until years after his death. An enormously controversial figure for the highly original and provocative positions he advocated, Spinoza is nowadays respected as one of the definitive ethicists and as a forerunner of enlightened modernity. His metaphysical views were essentially monistic and pantheistic, holding that God and nature were just two names for the same single underlying reality. Spinoza was born on 24th November 1632 in Amsterdam, Holland, to a family of Sephardic Jews descended from displaced Maranos from Portugal. His father was Abrao de Spinoza, a successful importer and merchant. His mother was Anna de Bora, who died when Spinoza was only six years old. He had a traditional Jewish upbringing and his early education consisted mainly of religious study, including instruction in Hebrew, liturgy, Torah, prophetic writings, and rabbinical commentaries. However, his critical, curious nature would soon come into conflict with the Jewish community. At the age of 17, when his father died in the wars against England and France, and the family fortune was decimated, Spinoza was forced to cut short his formal studies to help run the family business, although he was eventually able to relinquish responsibility for the business and its debts to his brother, Gabriel, and devote himself to his real love, that is, philosophy. He gave away his share of his father's inheritance to his sister and lived the rest of his life in poverty as a grinder of optical lenses. In 1656, Spinoza was issued a writ of kerem, which is the Jewish equivalent of excommunication, for the apostasy of how he conceived God and for various positions contrary to normative Jewish belief and his criticisms of the Talmud and other religious texts. He had reportedly been offered a thousand florins to keep quiet about his views, but had refused on principle. Following his excommunication, he adopted the first name Benedictus or Benedict, which is the Latin equivalent of Baroque, meaning blessed, or more informally, the Portuguese equivalent, Bento. After his excommunication, Spinoza lived and worked at times at the school of his old Latin teacher, Franciscus von den Enden, an atheist and devotee of the rationalism of Descartes, who was forbidden by the city government to propagate his doctrines publicly. He dedicated himself completely to philosophy, and his fervent desire was to change the world through establishing a clandestine philosophical sect although this was only eventually realized after his death through the dedicator intercession of his friends. He became acquainted with several collegians, members of an eclectic sect with tendencies towards rationalism, as well as corresponding with Petrus Serarius, a radical protestant and millenarian merchant who acted as a patron of Spinoza for a time. By the beginning of the 1660s, Spinoza's name had become more widely known, and he met and corresponded with Gottfried Leibniz and Henry Oldenburg. Around 1661, he relocated from Amsterdam to Regensburg near Leiden, and later lived in Wurburg, and then The Hague, earning a comfortable living from his work as an optician and lens grinding although he was also supported by small but regular donations from close friends. He never married, nor did he father any children. Spinoza's first publication was a geometric exposition of the work of Descartes. The two-part Principia Philosophiae Cartesiani, otherwise known as Principles of Cartesian Philosophy, published in 1663. In the early 1660s, he worked on what was to become his magnum work, the ethics, but he suspended the work in 1665 in favor of his other work, 
Tractatus Theologico Politicus, otherwise known as Theologico Political Treatise, which was eventually published anonymously in 1670. The public reaction to his work, though, was extremely unfavorable, and Spinoza was wary enough to abstain from publishing more of his works for the rest of his life. The Ethics and several other works were all published posthumously by his friends in secrecy. Even his colleague Leibniz disagreed harshly with it and published his own detailed refutation, although some of Leibniz's own work bear some striking resemblances to certain key parts of Spinoza's philosophy. In 1676, Spinoza met with Leibniz at The Hague to privately discuss his ethics, which he had just completed but not dare to publish. Spinoza died at the young age of 44 on 21st February 1677 in The Hague due to a lung illness. Even after his death, Spinoza did not escape controversy and in 1678, his works were banned throughout Holland. Works Although Spinoza is usually counted along with Descartes and Leibniz as one of the three major rationalists of the 17th century, his writings reveal the influence of such divergent sources as Stoicism, Jewish rationalism, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Descartes, and a variety of heterodox religious thinkers of his day and he made significant contributions in virtually every area of philosophy. His pursuits were eclectic and his thought was strikingly original, which makes him somewhat difficult to categorize. His first published work, The Principles of Cartesian Philosophy in 1663, was a systematic presentation of the philosophy of Descartes, to which he added his own suggestions for its improvement and it already contained many of the characteristic elements of his later work. The Theologico-Political Treatise in 1670 was an examination of superficial popular religion in general and a vigorous critique of the militant Protestantism practiced in Holland at the time. He argued that Christians and Jews could live peaceably together if they would only rise above the petty theological and cultural controversies that divided them. The core of Spinoza's ethical views was encapsulated in his early treatise on the improvement of the understanding. But his major work was the monumental Ethica Ordine Geometrico Demonstrata, which is otherwise known as Ethics, an abstract and difficult work finished in 1676, but only published posthumously in 1677. Each of its five constituent books comprises a long sequence of numbered propositions, each of which is deduced through a method consciously modeled on the deductive logic used by the Greek mathematician Euclid in his seminal work on geometry. Like Euclid, Spinoza started with a small set of self-evident definitions and axioms, meticulously build up his deductive argument and concluded each section with a triumphant. It is sometimes held up as a supreme example of a self-contained metaphysical system whose object is nothing less than to explain everything, the total scheme of reality. As a young man, Spinoza had subscribed to Descartes' belief in dualism that body and mind are two separate substances. However, he later changed his view and asserted that they were not separate but a single identity and that body and mind were just two names for the same reality. Starting from Descartes' definition of substance as that which requires nothing other than itself in order to exist, Spinoza's conclusion was quite different from that of Descartes. Where Descartes saw the one underlying substance as being God, Spinoza saw it as a totality of everything or nature. All of reality then was really just one substance and all apparently different objects were merely facets or aspects of that underlying substance. In this way, Spinoza refined Descartes' rather unsatisfactory treatment of the mind-body problem in philosophy of mind by positing that the physical and mental worlds were essentially one and the same thing. This was therefore a kind of monism as opposed to Descartes' dualism. 
it was a historically significant solution known as neutral monism. Following on from this analysis, then Spinoza saw God and nature as just two names for the same reality of the universe, essentially a kind of pantheism. Thus, he believed that there was just one set of rules governing the whole of reality and that the basis of the universe was a single substance of which all lesser entities are actually modes or modifications. Spinoza's God or nature was therefore a being of infinitely many attributes of which extension and thought were but the two that we can understand. He envisaged a God that was not a transcendent creator of the universe who rules over the universe by providence, but a God that itself is the deterministic system of which everything in nature is a part. Thus, for Spinoza, God effectively is the infinite natural world and he has no separate personality, nor is he in some way outside of nature that is supernatural. Spinoza was a thoroughgoing determinist who held that absolutely everything that happens occurs through the operation of necessity, leaving absolutely no room for free will and spontaneity. For him, even human behavior is fully determined and freedom or what we presume to be free will is limited to merely our capacity to know that we are determined and to understand why we act as we do. Nothing happens by chance in Spinoza's world and reason does not work in terms of contingency. Spinoza's ethics have much in common with Stoicism in as much as both philosophies sought to fulfill a therapeutic role by instructing people how to attain happiness or eudaimonism. He asserted that the highest good was knowledge of God, which was capable of bringing freedom from fear and the tyranny of the passions and ultimately true blessedness. However, Spinoza differed sharply from the Stoics in his rejection of their contention that reason could overcome emotion. He contended that an emotion can only be displaced or overcome by a stronger emotion and that knowledge of the true causes of passive emotions, that is those not rationally understood, could transform them into active emotions or ones that can be rationally understood. Thus, anticipating by over 200 years one of the key ideas of the psychoanalysis of Sigmund Freud. Spinoza took the moral relativist position that nothing is intrinsically good or bad except to the extent that it is subjectively perceived to be by the individual. In a completely ordered world where necessity reigns, the concepts of good and evil can have no absolute meaning. Everything that happens comes from the essential nature of objects or of God nature and so, according to Spinoza, reality is perfection and everything done by humans and other animals is also excellent and divine. If circumstances sometimes appear unfortunate or less than perfect to us, it is only because of our inadequate conception of reality. He asserted that sense perception, though practical and useful for rhetoric, is inadequate for discovering universal truth. While it is easy to see why both the Jewish and Christian authorities of Spinoza's day felt both appalled and threatened by his ideas, his philosophy did hold an attraction for the late 18th century Europeans in that it provided an alternative to materialism, atheism and deism. Three of Spinoza's ideas in particular strongly appealed to them. The unity of all that exists, the regularity and order of all that happens and the identity of spirit and nature. Geometric method and the ethics. Upon opening Spinoza's masterpiece, The Ethics, one is immediately struck by its form. It's written in the style of a geometrical treatise, much like Euclid's Elements, with each book comprising a set of definitions, axioms, propositions, scholia, and other features that make up the formal apparatus of geometry. One wonders why Spinoza would have employed this mode of presentation. The effort it required must have been enormous and the result is a work that only the most dedicated of readers can make their way through. 
Some of this is explained by the fact that the 17th century was a time in which geometry was enjoying a resurgence of interest and was held in extraordinarily high esteem, especially within the intellectual circles in which Spinoza moved. We may add to this the fact that Spinoza, though not a Cartesian, was an avid student of Descartes' works. As is well known, Descartes was a leading advocate of the use of geometric method within philosophy, and his meditations was written more in the geometrical style. In this respect, the ethics can be said to be Cartesian in inspiration. While this characterization is true, it needs qualification. The meditations and the ethics are very different works, not just in substance, but also in style. In order to understand this difference, one must take into account the distinction between two types of geometrical method, the analytic and the synthetic. The analytic method is a way of discovery. Its aim is to lead the mind to the apprehension of primary truths that can serve as a foundation of a discipline. The synthetic method is a way of invention. Its aim is to build up from a set of primary truths a system of results, each of which is fully established on the basis of what has come before. As a meditations is a work whose explicit aim is to establish the foundations of scientific knowledge, it is appropriate that it employs the analytic method. The ethics, however, has another aim, one for which the synthetic method is appropriate. As its title indicates, the ethics is a work of ethical philosophy. Its ultimate aim is to aid us in the attainment of happiness which is to be found in the intellectual love of God. This love, according to Spinoza, arises out of the knowledge that we gain of the divine essence insofar as we see how the essences of singular things follow of necessity from it. In view of this, it is easy to see why Spinoza favored the synthetic method. Beginning with propositions concerning God, he was able to employ it to show how all other things can be derived from God. In grasping the order of prepositions as they are demonstrated in the ethics, we thus attain a kind of knowledge that approximates the knowledge that underwrites human happiness. We are, as it were, put on the road towards happiness. Of the two methods, it is only the synthetic method that is suitable for this purpose. Human knowledge. Spinoza maintained that human beings do have particular faculties whose functions are to provide some degree of knowledge. For example, that there may be some correlation between thought and extension with regard to sensations produced by the action of other bodies upon our eyes, ears and fingertips. Even our memory may occasionally harbor some evidence of the order and connection common to things and ideas. And in self-conscious awareness, one seemed to achieve genuine knowledge of himself by representing his mind to itself, using ideas to signify other ideas. Near the end of the book two, Spinoza distinguished three kinds of knowledge of which we may be capable. First, opinion, derived either from vague sensory experience or from the signification of words in the memory or imagination, provides only inadequate ideas and cannot be relied upon as a source of truth. The second one is reason, which begins with simple adequate ideas, as by analyzing causal or logical necessity proceeds towards awareness of their more general causes, thus provide us with truth. But intuition, in which the mind deduces the structure of reality from the very essence or idea of God, is a great source of adequate ideas, the highest form of knowledge, and the ultimate guarantor of truth. Spinoza, therefore, recommends a three-step process for the achievement of human knowledge. First, disregard the misleading testimony of the senses and conventional learning. Second, starting from the adequate idea of any one existing thing, reason back to the eternal attribute of God from which it derives. Finally, use this knowledge of the divine essence to intuit everything else that ever was, is and will be. Indeed, he supposed that the ethics itself is an exercise in this ultimate pursuit of indubitable knowledge. Action, goodness and freedom. The last three books of the ethics collectively describe how to live consistently 
on Spinozistic principles. All human behavior results from desire or the perception of pain, so it flows necessarily from the eternal attributes of thought and extension. But Spinoza pointed out a crucial distinction between two kinds of cases. Sometimes we are wholly unaware of the causes that underlie what we do, and we simply are overwhelmed by the strength of our momentary passions. But at other times, we have adequate knowledge of the motives for what we do and can engage in deliberate actions because we recognize our place within the grander scheme of reality as a whole. It is in this fashion that moral value enters Spinoza's system. Good or evil just is what serves or hinders the long-term interest of life. Since our actions invariably follow from emotion or desire, we always do what we believe to be the good, which will truly be so if we have adequate ideas of everything involved. The greatest good of human life, then, is to understand one's place in the structure of the universe as a natural expression of the essence of God. But how can we speak of moral responsibility when every human action is determined with rigid necessity? Remember that, for Spinoza, freedom is self-determination. So, when we acquire adequate knowledge of the emotions and desires that are the internal causes of all our actions, when we understand why we do what we do, then we are truly free. Although we can neither change the way things are, nor hope that we will be rewarded, we must continue to live and act with the calm confidence that we are a necessary component of an infinitely greater and more important whole. This way of life may not be easy, Spinoza declared, but all noble things are as difficult as they are rare. Let us summarize what we have discussed so far. Baruch Spinoza was born to Portuguese Jews living in exile in Holland, but his life among the Maranos there was often unsettled. Despite an early rabbinical education, he was expelled from the synagogue at Amsterdam for defending heretical opinions in 1656. While engaging privately in serious study of medieval Jewish thought, Cartesian philosophy, and the new science at Regenberg and the Hague, Spinoza supported himself by grinding optical lenses, an occupation that probably contributed to the consumption that killed him. Private circulation of his philosophical treatises soon earned him a significant reputation throughout Europe, but Spinoza so treasured his intellectual independence that, in 1673, he declined the opportunity to teach at Heidelberg, preferring to continue his endeavors alone. Spinoza does not pretend that any of this is easy. The acquisition of adequate ideas, especially those by which we attain knowledge of the third kind, is difficult, and we can never completely escape the influence of the passions. Nevertheless, Spinoza holds out to those who make the effort the promise not of personal immortality, but of participation in eternity within this life. Now, let us try to answer the following questions. Explain the concept of dualism. Briefly narrate the life sketch of Spinoza. Distinguish the ideas of Spinoza and Descartes. Give a brief note on Spinoza's first work, The Principles of Cartesian Philosophy. Compare and contradict the views of Spinoza and Leibniz. Critically analyze Spinoza's work, The Ethics. How does Spinoza perceive human knowledge? Which are Spinoza's three ideas that invited criticism from Christians and Jews? Hope you go through the following books for further understanding. Spinoza Opera, edited by C. Gebhardt in 1925. The Collected Works of Spinoza, edited by Edwin Curley, 1985. Benedict de Spinoza, Ethics Including the Improvement of the Understanding, translated by R. H. M. Elvis, 1989. Baruch Spinoza, Theologico-Political Treatise, translated by R. H. M. Elvis, 1951. The Cambridge Companion to Spinoza, edited by Don Garrett, 1995. Benedict de Spinoza, an Introduction, by Henry Allison, 1987. Spinoza, by Roger Scruton, 1999. Routledge Philosophy Guidebook to Spinoza and the Ethics, by Genevieve Lloyd, in 1996. Hope you enjoyed this session. We can meet again soon with another topic. Have a nice day.